I'm very into music and um, also seem to be inclined towards business. And so starting as a teenager, I started thinking I'd like to do something involved with music and business. And if you ask me what that meant at the time, I didn't really necessarily understand what the music business was. So, uh, you know, at the time I might have thought like, oh, I could work in a music store or sell trumpets or, you know, it was beyond my wildest dreams that I would get into a record label or something like that. And it wasn't until I was in college and I started going to nightclubs and experiencing the music scene that I understood that there was a music business that created the music scene. Uh, so it was probably around 1988 or so when I had the Eureka moment and it was at a place called The Living Room in Providence, Rhode Island, seeing the band Max Creek, where uh, I was 18 years old. I was going to the University of Massachusetts and I was standing there on a Wednesday night for the uh, weekly show that Max Creek was doing there at the time. And I was looking at the, the door and seeing all the people coming in at a $10 cover. And I was looking at the bar and all the people buying uh, Bud Longnecks. And uh, that's when this moment dawned on me. I was like, oh, this is the music business. Um, and that sort of planted a seed in my head. A couple of years later, um, when I was living in a cooperative house in Eugene, Oregon, I was attending the University of Oregon, I went to the basement and my buddy's band was rehearsing there. And I thought they sounded great and it was super fun. And I said, hey, uh, who's managing you guys? And they said, do you want to do it? Uh, and that's the first foray I took into uh, starting to work with uh, a band and getting them gigs and getting involved. And that was 34 years ago, maybe 35. And I just started booking gigs from scratch and just completely concentrated on it. And it's been my business ever since. And talk a little bit about performing. So you have a band called Rice, is that your first band? Or have you had bands in the past? Or? In, the, in the late 90s in Eugene, I had a band called Freaks of Nature. And uh, we toured four states on the West Coast, played about 150 shows in two years. Uh, had a great time. Uh, taught me how to be in a band. Uh, it inspired me to be a songwriter. I wrote probably 25 or 30 songs in that two years. And it really got me back involved with the music business. Um, I had worked straight jobs for a little while. And it really got me back involved. Being on the stage really helped me to understand the challenges of what performing uh, was. And it helped to really infuse my business as an agent. Uh, I was able to envision and internalize the challenges of going from show to show. And so when I suggested a room to somebody or a travel plan, I at least had experience myself to understand what it would be like to do that myself. So that really infused my uh, business sense and how I run Simon Says Booking as an agency. Um, uh, but you know, the vast majority of what I do has been on the agent and concert promoter side. Uh, I really enjoy performing. Uh, I enjoy writing, uh, but I don't mistake myself for my clients. Uh, they're the true talent. So looking at the industry, you always just wanted to pursue more the promoting side professionally as opposed to the performing yeah. side. Yeah, the music business is where uh, I've always been interested. You know, I'm proud of the, you know, the songs that I write and I really enjoy performing, but I don't mistake myself for, for the true talent. And uh, frankly, when I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking about gigs that I'm booking for other bands. Um, I, I really, I get excited for the gigs that I'm doing myself, but I do probably 15, 20 shows a year myself uh, with my band, Rice, an American band. But uh, I have 15 to 20 shows a week for the bands that I represent. So what drew you more to the promoting side? Um, this whole music business idea, I, I'm, I'm a salesperson at heart, um, and the idea that I could make my living out of something that I enjoy. You know, I was a teenager, and uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s, you know, you spent a lot of time talking on the phone as a teenager, uh, and I mean an actual phone uh, that you spoke on. And my mom said to me once at the dinner table, you know, do you think that you're going to, you know, be able to talk to people about music? you know, and make a living. And I'm making that more derisive than, uh, than it probably was. But I was like, yeah, actually, I, I think I am going to be able to do that. And so this idea that I could take my passion for music, which is really deep for me, 
um, and in particular live music and turn that into something that I could make a career out of was something that I dreamt as a young person. And then once I started to make that happen, uh, I really concentrated on it with a focus that was career driven. And I'm lucky to say that it's turned out, been able to raise a family and you know have a house and, and have a reputation and a career in uh, music business. What would you say is one of the best things about working in music? Like, what keeps you going and saying, I want to keep doing this? Well, it's, it's not cogs or guns or butter or whatever. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm really proud that we were able to put out a really great product. Uh, it's ethereal. So, uh, whereas if you're selling books, you, it's a book. You buy the book and then you sell the book and then maybe you make a buck or whatever. This is much more of an idea. You're selling a happening. Um, there's no warehouse where I keep live concerts. So uh, when I talk to somebody and I make an arrangement, um, it's a lot of people coming together in order to create joy and to create art and to create music. And to me, that's something that's much better than a book or, or a widget, if you will. So you think a positive aspect of music is the community it can create? I, I think that in modern society, where we're much less focused on um, religion and a certain, you know, the younger generation is a lot less focused on uh, political parties or where you went to college or what fraternity you were in. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things, by the way. Um, I, I think that for uh, people of my generation and generations younger, they're really looking at what they do for fun or they do for art as the community that they're building. So whether you look at you know metalheads or juggalos or deadheads or people who love classical music, that is what they're doing and that's how they're planning their year. And that those are the people that they know. That's their community. And that extends beyond geographic borders and that extends beyond necessarily a, a particular political thought or religious thought or philosophy. We all love this band and we're gonna spend our time doing this band. And, and I know where I'm gonna be on Halloween because the band is playing there. And I think that uh, in my unique position where I represent a lot of bands and I work in a lot of genres, um, it, it means I'm involved with a lot of communities. And I think that that's just really something special. I didn't, I didn't necessarily know that that was gonna happen when I started, but uh, for me, it's really just a great thing to be able to be uh, involved and belong to all these different communities of musicians. So there's a lot of positive, positive aspects of the music industry, but what do you think are some flaws of somebody who might be wanting to come in um, starting their own company promoting bands in today's market or coming in as a musician today? You know, what do you think some of the flaws that might hold them back from getting to where they want to be? Challenges, uh, I might say. Um, well, a career isn't necessarily just about passion and just doing what you want to do all day long. A career, by sort of the capitalistic uh, intention, is that you're doing tasks all day and that you trade those tasks for money. And the music industry or the art industry, whether we're talking about music or visual art or photography or videography, that's a really challenging business. And to be able to stay art focused while doing these tasks and trade it for money is something that really took me decades to put together. My first 10 years, I made very little, pretty much no money. Um, and about 10 years in, I got to the point where I was making a poverty level wage. I was like, yes. Uh, and it wasn't until a few years later, I'd say 12 to 15 years into it, that there was actual money involved. Um, so it takes a lot of patience and resource in order to get from your ideas into a position where it's career oriented and income generating. You want to play for people who want to hear you and you want to play for people. Nobody likes playing for chairs um, so, uh, or, or an empty field. So I think every young musician or developing musician or band, it's always about being able to create a crowd. So rare is the occasion where you think about an unsuccessful show or an empty show and think like, wow, that was a great show. It's always about people being there and sharing your vision with other people, having them hear and understand it and, and be moved by it. Um, so the, you know, that's the best, being at a festival in front of an audience. Uh, really, I mean, anywhere. I'd be happy in somebody's living room if there was 20 people there paying attention. 
So it's about, it's about the exchange of energy, art, and ideas between the performer and the writer and the listener. And that's, you know, when, when you actually get that, it's a rare thing. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, luckier are the people who get to do that every time they play. Um, most of us uh, who work in music, uh, we're just happy when there's people in front of us. Do you have any memorable gigs that are always going to stick with you? I mean, a million of them. Yeah. Um, you know, or, you know, at least I hope. Uh, you know, recently I played right here at the Shea Theater in Turner's Falls. And, you know, there was a lively crowd. And it was people uh, who were here were attending, uh, had been sharing uh, our artistic vision for years. Uh, that was great. Um, the Barter Fair in Oregon was a great gig. I, I probably have a distinct memory of every time I've played Wormtown and Strange Creek. Those have been great gigs. Jerry Jam uh, up in Bath, New Hampshire has been super fun. I had a great gig uh, playing at the City Stage in Springfield in front of a couple hundred people. Uh, and that was just great. Uh, I, I had an amazing experience very early in uh, the uh, you know the life of Rice and American Band. We played something called the Redneck Olympics up in Maine, and that was just a crazy gig with people doing mud bogging, and uh, you know it, it was just insane. Uh, there was a, a toilet seat toss and truck running, and you know it, that was a crazy gig, and it was probably the most people I ever played in front of. And and again, people being there to accept your message and your vision uh, is really what we're all, all after. And so I guess it's not a coincidence that one of my most memorable gigs was also one of the most well attended. So would you also say that music has taken you places that you've never really pictured yourself being? When, when oh, you assuredly, it? assuredly. Um, you know, I, if I found myself performing in San Francisco, in Seattle, um, you know, in Boston and, you know, in, in the woods in Vermont. You know, every once in a while you're, you're standing somewhere and you say, you know, how did, how did we get here on this day? Um, and that's always just so exciting. Um, and it's because of people who have this uh, shared vision about promoting live music and promoting art and bringing people together in order to make that happen. So I'm, I'm just lucky to be a part of a, of a grand community all over the country. So this could be kind of long, but just um, whatever you feel. How would you say that music has had a positive impact on your life? I mean, music is the rhythm and the soundtrack of my entire life. Um, I, can, I can remember, you know, the first songs that I could remember hearing, you know, Crocodile Rock or uh, Love is Like Oxygen, which I think was, uh, what, like Sweet or something like that. Uh, I remember uh, this little AM radio I had as a six-year-old. I remember the first concerts that I went to see. And I remember what we were listening to when I met certain people. Or I remember where I was when I heard a song for the first time. I was driving down I-5 um, from Springfield, Oregon to uh, Eugene, um, or thereabouts. Um, and when I heard David Bowie's uh, I'm Afraid of Americans for the first time. I was driving around um, uh, you know, River Street in Eugene when I heard uh, Sublime for the first time. Um, I, I can remember being in my sister's bedroom in 1979 when my brother brought home Pink Floyd's The Wall, and I listened to that for the first time. So uh, to me, uh, the, the memories that are created in association with music are my most positive memories. So how has the music industry changed from when you first started all those years ago? I, it's completely different. Um, the music industry at that time... Um, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, if, uh, if you were going out on a date, you had a couple options. Dinner and a movie, or do you want to go see a show? Um, now there's, you know, uh, three-dimensional art popping out of your phone. There's 52 different kinds of sports leagues. You know, uh, you know 10,000 television channels. You can summon up any movie that's ever been made uh, through your phone. You can travel all over the country easily. So the competition now is uh, for people's attention and entertainment dollars is completely different. Um, the vast majority of people would go to concerts all the time. Now, uh, every few years there's been a rising challenge that uh, shrinks 
the audience for live music, um, the raising of the drinking age from 18 to 21, which I'm sure was a positive thing, but it radically reduced the size of the concert going audience. And then uh, the station nightclub fire and insurance rates and uh, the pandemic and a wide variety of things has continued to shrink the size of the live music audience. And even though the population grows, the number of people going to live music on any given night is ever more challenging and competitive. So it's much more difficult uh, for bands to have the freedom to grow, whereas a band that was forming in 1975 could play in their basement, and the next thing they knew, they were playing in clubs. They could hone their craft in local clubs because there was a vibrant club scene no matter where you were. And you could have grown up in Kansas uh, and been playing the clubs around where you're from, and the next thing you know, uh, you're playing in Chicago, and then you got a record deal, and you're off touring the world. Um, that is no longer really the story. Um, so, I don't mean to interrupt you, but would you say that more musicians are getting to that point by, by social media today as opposed to going out and gigging to get there? Um, yeah, so... People are becoming famous on YouTube and, you know, all these social media sites. Yeah, music and yeah, that's a thing, but um, something that happened, and it happened very quietly, there were people talking about it, but in 2001 when Napster came out, in a, a short period of time, less than a year, the entire record industry was decimated by the creation of an app, software. Um, when I was growing up, if you, if you got a couple extra bucks, you'd run to the record store and buy yourself some music. And basically in 2001, it made it so that music wasn't something you needed to own anymore. And that removed one of only a few ways to make money in music, it pretty much killed the record industry overnight. Now the record industry surely still exists, but what uh, Napster did is it replaced the traditional model of the record industry, a and r and a studio, and then a record product, and then selling that product via promotion in order to generate money for both the record and uh, record company and the songwriter and the performer. That model was turned on its head because suddenly you didn't need a record company anymore and a young kid could get onto YouTube and impress a producer from 10,000 miles away and the next thing you knew, uh, it might mean something. Now, it created a wild west of um, you know, MySpace and Bandcamp and Napster and YouTube became this wide open field for a wide variety of people to create music and art in order to uh, get their message out there. What happened over the next 10 or 15 years to get to where we are now is, is that marketplace became so crowded that people are just as competitive to get attention um, on Bandcamp and YouTube and you know, uh, however uh, you may be able to get people to listen to your music. So it's interesting, we replaced record labels with everyone. And the platforms themselves somewhat become the delivery method. So it used to be, oh, I got to deal with Warner Brothers or I got to deal with Sony. Now you have to get on somebody's For You page or you have to be the featured band on Bandcamp or we were lucky enough to get uh, you know, SoundCloud uh, you know, attention. Um, so the, the whole process is much different than it was 20 years ago. There was 50 years of a music business that went really only one way. And now that model has been really broken open. I don't know if it's made it any easier. Um, I still think that the odds are against any particular musician, but it's made it so that it's in um, different people's control. Do you think the odds are against any artist? Um, I mean, I think that the, uh, the odds are against any artist. Yeah, I mean, you have a million to one shot. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, there's a reason that your mother told you not to go into this. And, uh, and it's because it's very, very difficult. Um, people believe that um, musicians go into it because they don't uh, want to go into something else or whatever, or that it's, you know, it's an artist's life and... Um, you know, what is it, uh, uh, John Lennon said, you know, it's easier to write a song when sitting on a cushion or whatever. But the truth is, is that to become an artist or a musician means that you are going to work two or three or four times harder than a person with a normal job without any indication that you might get paid for it. And that is a level of passion and devotion that is different than, um, you know, a normal wage-oriented job. It is very, very challenging. 
So if you could jump in a time machine and go back to the 80s, what are some, like, what's some advice <laughs> you'd give to your younger self coming into this? Don't do it? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm really thrilled with the way that it turned out. Um, uh, actually, I'm, I'm really happy I stayed independent. Um, I never worked for a major agency or a major music distribution company. I've made all my own decisions. Um, I might say, you know, don't pay that much attention to the politics or the drama at any given moment. Uh, you know, you can get you can get worked up about these things, but uh, I feel like I've, uh, you know, like maybe I did, maybe I did get a visit from my future self, and I've remained uh, focused on what it is that I want to do, uh, and it's turned out great for me. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled, and I th I feel like maybe my greatest accomplishment is uh, sharing uh, my efforts with other people, and that has worked out for them a little bit too. So where do you see the music industry going in the future? Do you still see people coming to theaters and going to shows and festivals and stuff like that? Um, do you see festivals becoming more prominent now than 20, you know, 25 years ago? Or? Well, no, I mean, a festival is merely a gathering. And it's a gathering around a particular idea. And there has been music festivals and camping festivals and religious festivals um, cultural festivals, those are as old as, you know, civilization itself. So I think that there will always be people who enjoy the live music experience and they will continue to go to these things. Um, you know, it'll go in and out of fashion and in and out of favor, but there's something about rhythm and melody and harmony and lyrics put together that speaks to the human spirit and to the soul. And I think that that is the purpose of music. And I think as long as people have souls and are searching for soulfulness, uh, they will continue to enjoy music and they'll continue to enjoy it within a community and within an, uh, a crowd, you know, within an assembled uh, group of people who are like-minded or who want to discover new ideas. Um, people have been enjoying music for as long as there's been people who enjoyed hanging out together. And if music has a great power, it's to bring people together. And I'm hopeful that that continues forever. You know, all art forms are a, a combination of task and process and vision and soul. And you have to have all of those things. You have to be skilled at an instrument. You have to have um, um, a soulful intention. You have to have enough intellect to be able to put it out there. You have to have a voice. And all of these things exist in combination, and that's what makes it art. You know, I think that anybody can, um, you know, press buttons in order to create sounds in a row, but it doesn't become music until it has intention, melody, rhythm, harmony, and a message. And that's when it becomes music rather than just a series of tones. So doing um, promoting or performing professionally, do you think there's a certain recipe that somebody should follow? Or is it more like, you know, the lucky can pay their bills off of it or is it you know whoever puts well, the amount of energy into it or i mean there's luck and there's skill and you know that's that's the same thing for for anything um my father-in-law used to say um you either have to be 10 percent better or you have to be 10 percent different um and sometimes people are both uh which is great uh to me it's always about intention knowing what it is that people like about what it is that you do and serving them a lot of that you know, what, you know, what style of music are you into and are you proficient at it and can you do it well? And then do you do a lot of it? Um, you know, what's your intention in terms of writing? What kind of message do you put out and can you put it out over and over again in different ways? Um, so really understanding what it is that you're trying to do and to be able to unfold that over a period of time in multiple ways. To me, that's what makes a good artist. Um, you know, really understanding what people like about them and moreover, really an artist understanding what they're good at and what they like to do and what message they're trying to do and to be able to do it over and over again in slightly different ways in order to have a tapestry of message. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. My pleasure. Go see live music. Yes, and they should come by the Shea, right? Yeah, the Shea Theater or, you know, uh, check out livemusicnewsandreview.com and let people know what you're doing, uh, you know, with the own, your own live music or uh, the shows that you see. And just more importantly, just go out, see a band, have a good time, have a beverage, you know, and just enjoy being a human. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you.